protecting the network. So as we continue our discussion of network security, we're going to talk about things you can do to protect your network. To successfully defend against the network, uh, to defend our network against attacks, as system administrators and network administrators, we have to consider a lot of different things. We have, have to consider our physical controls and what we can do to protect the network. As we discussed earlier, if we have somebody who attacks our power or our HVAC systems, that can affect our servers as and networks as well. The next thing we want to consider is our user training. We'll talk more about that later, but the users are one of our biggest problems we have in securing our networks. Uh, another thing we have to do is we have to patch our systems and update our operating systems as well as our network gear. If there is a known vulnerability and you don't patch for it, the hackers already know the way in and you just gave them the keys. Security policies are usually handled by management and they're going to be the policies and procedures that are in place for us to follow to secure our networks better and ensure that we're doing things properly. We deal with incident response. We're dealing with how are we going to respond when an, accident, when an incident happens. If a hacker gets into your systems, how are you going to stop them and how are you going to recover from it? For vulnerability scanning, we're talking about finding what vulnerabilities you have, finding those unpatched systems, and finding the ways that hackers are going to get into your networks. Honeypots and honey nets, we'll talk about those as well. Those are distractors for the attackers. We're going to put those in our network so that the attackers go after those instead of going after our actual resources. And the last thing we're going to talk about is remote access security and how we can protect our network when we do allow remote access to, uh, of our users. So starting with physical controls. With physical controls, the number one thing you want to do is reduce your unauthorized access. So if we have a telecommunications closet, we should have it locked up. We shouldn't have anyone who can just go in there and patch things into the switches or patch things into our routers. Another thing you can do is you can use a man trap. And a lot of people get confused on what a man trap is. Uh, in the picture here, I show you an example of what a man trap is. You see that circular doorway. It allows one person to go in or one person to go out at a time. If you think of going to Disney World and you have those little turnstile gates or you go to a, a football game, same kind of thing. Those are man traps. It allows one person to go through at a time. And generally, we'll do that in combination with some sort of a keypad or a lock. In this case, they're using a hand scanner. Once he verifies, it'll open the door and let him go through. The uh, next thing we do is keypads. We can do that with either PIN numbers or we can do it with RFID badges, radio frequency badges, handprints, eyeball scans, all sorts of different ways to gain access that way through a keypad. The other thing you want to make sure is you lock your facilities. So when you're done for the night, everything should be locked up. If you have a room that is not manned and there's not somebody in there 24 hours a day, that room should be locked up. Things like telecommunication closets and server rooms need to remain locked so that people like the janitors uh, and the custodial staff can't come in and get into the gear that you have. There's lots of different ways to authenticate somebody's access to a physical area. Uh, we can do things like I said, badges like RFID badges. We can use biometrics such as your voice print, your uh, retinal scans, fingerprints. Uh, we can do hand scans as they're doing here on this particular picture. We can use key fobs which might be radio frequency as well. Uh, we can use PIN numbers or a password. Uh, for instance, where I work, I have to scan my badge which is an RFID badge and put in a PIN number. Between those two things, then the man trap opens and lets me walk through the, the front entrance. The next thing we're going to talk about is training. And training your users is a very important thing to do. Our users are one of the greatest vulnerabilities we have in our networks. We can do all the automated systems we want, put in all the antivirus, we can put in intrusion detection systems and intrusion protection systems, we can put in routers and do uh, ACLs to protect traffic from coming in or out, and we can do firewalls that are going to protect things from getting into our networks. But at the end of the day, if your users click on that link in that spear phishing email, they have just invited in the bad guy. And so we really have to train our users. We need to train them on social engineering awareness, things like spear phishing and phishing emails, as well as malware and trojans. We need to uh, train them on virus transmission dangers, all those malicious software that can get into our systems. Because if they download that software thinking they're going to get the latest uh, you know, rock album, and they let the virus in, we're going to be fighting it all day. Uh, password security. Most of our companies require a long, strong password. Well, if the user writes it down and puts it on a sticky note under their keyboard, it doesn't really provide you much protection, does it? Um, and some people laugh at that, but I will tell you, I've done a lot of assessments, and the first place I always look for passwords is under the keyboard, because that's where most people put it. It's either under the keyboard or in the desk drawer. Uh, next thing is email security. You want to make sure people understand the emails they're receiving, they know which ones they can open which ones they can't open. Because um, if you open one in the read pane of your Outlook, for instance, it can actually load malicious software if it's from an unknown user. And the last one is physical security. Again, we can do all these things of the man traps and locking our doors, but if our users let people in that they shouldn't, 
that's going to end up bypassing our security. So again, we have to provide user training to ensure that they are properly trained against these threats. The next thing we're going to talk about is patching. And what patches are, are a piece of software that's designed to correct a known bug and fix a known vulnerability in an application or program. So we're all pretty familiar, if you have Windows, with Patch Tuesday, where every Tuesday, Microsoft will release its patches, and you'll get the Windows updates that pop up and say, you need to update your software. And a lot of people will just hit, eh, remind me later, or ignore, right? If you do that, what Microsoft is saying is, we found a problem with our software. We have corrected it by having this software code in place. If you install that code, you won't be vulnerable to that particular exploit. But if you ignore it or delay it, all that time that you're delaying it, the attackers know how to get in. Because Microsoft said, this is the vulnerability we have, and here's why it works. And so the attackers use that as a way of roadmap of how to get into systems. One of the number one ways that people get into systems is by going after known vulnerabilities, because a lot of people don't patch their systems. Patches should be implemented as soon as they become available. But the first thing you should do if you're running a large network is you need to test that patch first. There have been cases where if you download the, the Microsoft update and apply it to all your systems, you can crash your network uh, or you can crash those systems. So what normally we do in a large enterprise environment is we will have a test lab, which has a model of the computer that all the users are using. And we'll install it against that first and make sure it doesn't break anything. And so if that goes successfully, then we'll roll it out to all of our users. Okay? Updates are things that will add new features. Patches are what you're used to fix vulnerabilities. If you put an update to a software, it may introduce more vulnerabilities. So if I had a word processing program and I just added the capability of you to highlight things in your document, that code may have a bug and that could introduce a new vulnerability. So just keep that in mind when you're moving from one version of a software to another, it may not be a security patch, it could be an update adding new features. What you want to look for is always getting those patches that are going to fix the bugs and make your system more secure. Security policies are usually created by management, and if you have a lack, if you don't have a good security policy or you don't enforce your security policy, it's one of the reasons that we end up having breaches. Security policies have multiple purposes. They protect your organization's assets. They make your employees aware of their obligations and let them know what they need to do. It identifies specific security uh, solutions, and it also acts as a baseline for ongoing security monitoring. So one of the most common security policies that most people have in corporations is what we call the acceptable use policy. And every acceptable use policy is going to be a little different depending on where you work. Uh, where I work, we have a policy that says you cannot go to gambling websites at work. You cannot go to pornography websites at work. Um, we used to have in there that you couldn't go to webmail like Gmail or Yahoo at work because it bypassed our virus scanning filters. And so those were all things that were against our acceptable use policy. Now the policy itself doesn't stop people from going to those things. We as administrators would put in electronic means to stop them using either firewall rules uh, or proxy servers. But again, the acceptable use policy that management made dictates what we as administrators would then implement. So some components that we have in a security policy is we may have uh, four different general areas. We have our governing policy, which will be the big overarching security policy for our organization. And then we'll have the technical policies that may have the things like, here's how you configure the ACLs the access control list, or here's how you're going to configure your firewall. You're going to have your end user policies like the acceptable use agreement that we just talked about. You're going to have your standards, guidelines, and procedures that would tell you if we have an issue, like for instance you might have one for your instant response, and it would say when we have an instant response, here are the standards guidelines that we're going to use. These security policies can contain a myriad of other policies as part of them. In large organizations, you tend to have an overarching policy and many sub-policies. If you're in a small business environment, you're generally just going to have one policy that covers everything. So the different parts of our security policy, we have that governing policy. This is a managerial focused policy and it also goes against our technical employees. It is a high level document that focuses what we're going to do in our organization. Our technical policies are ones that have to deal with specific technical issues, such as how are we going to handle email, how are we going to handle wireless, how are we going to handle remote access or bringing your own device, the BYOD? BYOD is becoming very, very popular now in a lot of organizations. Um, one thing we have to keep in mind is that BYOD brings a lot of new vulnerabilities, though, because you're allowing people to connect to your network, and you don't have control over that end device. So with BYOD, it might be like you're bringing your iPad tablet with you to work and connecting to their network to do work, or you're bringing your laptop, your personal laptop, and connecting it to the network. If you have vulnerabilities on that personal laptop, the network just inherited those vulnerabilities. 
Three big areas that we talk about with BYOD as well is when you bring these devices like tablets and mobile phones that have Bluetooth. We can have what's called bluejacking, where we send unauthorized messages over Bluetooth, and attackers can use that against you. Blue snarfing is where unauthorized access to wireless is gained because of Bluetooth. So if I'm close enough to your device, I can access your device via Bluetooth and then use that to piggyback onto the wireless network and attack it. Blue bugging is where you use an unauthorized backdoor to connect to these Bluetooth devices back to the attacker. And so the attacker or the victim, once they're on the network, it then makes a call out via Bluetooth to the attacker who's sitting maybe in the parking lot. Um, another area we talk about is end user policies. Again, this would be like your acceptable use policy. If you have a consent to monitoring policy, a lot of organizations will do that. Um, for instance, where I work with the government, we have a consent to monitoring policy so that if you're working there and you're on the computer, you have consented that the government can look at your emails and what you're doing on their, on their systems. A lot of organizations will have that as well, and it's a legal document they have to have in place before they can look through your traffic. Uh, cellular devices, is they, if they have an end user policy for cellular, for instance, in one of the um, former places I worked, we had a cellular device policy that said, we're going to issue you a BlackBerry. You can use it for work-related email and work-related websites. We don't want you going and doing personal stuff on it because they were paying the bill for that cell phone and paying the bill for that data usage. And that's a very common thing as well. Also part of our policy there was that you couldn't connect that cell phone to wireless. You had to use it through cellular because connecting to wireless at Starbucks made that vulnerable. Uh, and then we have the standards, guidelines, and procedures like I talked about before. That's kind of the catch-all, everything else, uh, big oversight policies. So incident response. How is your organization going to respond to its security breaches? Because it's not a question of if you're going to have a security breach. It's really more of a question of when you're going to have a security breach. Uh, instant response tells us how we're going to react. So are you going to per, uh, prosecute people for the crimes that are committed? Sometimes we will, sometimes we won't. If you think about some of the big breaches we've had over the last year with Home Depot and Target and those type of things, um, I don't know if they've ever found the people who are responsible for that or if they're even going to do it. Because again, you're talking about people who are across country lines or across state lines that makes it very difficult. Prosecution becomes very difficult because you have to prove means, motive, and opportunity. You have to show that the suspect had the technical skill to perform the attack. You have to show the motive of why they would want to perform the attack, and you have to have the, op they have the opportunity, the time, and the access to perform the attack. Incident responses aren't just outside people out of your organization either. You can have an incident response because you have an insider threat. If you look at the uh, National Security Agency with the Edward Snowden issue, where he stole a bunch of documents and data from him, that was an insider threat that caused a huge incident response on their part, trying to clean up the mess that he left. So this can become an inside or an outside issue, um, but you have to have things in place so you know how you're going to respond and how you're going to protect that data until the authorities come there if you're trying to do prosecution or get your business back online after being taken down by one of these big breaches. Vulnerability scanners are a way for us to test our network to verify if our security components are behaving as we think they should. It will also be used to detect unknown vulnerabilities. So vulnerability scanners are essentially an application that we use to conduct these tests. Some good examples are things like Nessus or ZenMap or NMap. ZenMap and NMap are both uh, vulnerability scanners that use the checking of your ports on your network and they map out your network. And so they'll be able to actually go out and touch your network and go, okay, there's a Windows XP machine here, there's a Windows 2003 machine over here, there's a Windows 2008 machine over here. And they'll figure out the IP addresses and what your network looks like. Using that information, they can then go to the next step and use something like Nessus or even use something like Metasploit to go after those vulnerabilities. Uh, Nessus takes it a step further. It does the network mapping portion, and then it goes a step further and actually finds, if you're running Windows XP, it will check if you have all the software updates installed that patches we talked about earlier. And if you're missing a patch, it will bring that up and say, this particular machine is missing this patch. And if you do a scan of your entire network, it can actually bring up a screen that will tell you, you have 3,000 machines, 270 of them are missing this particular patch. And so you can tell your system administrators to go make sure those patches are installed on those machines. And that's the way vulnerability scanners work. They're really looking at the ways to get around, over, or through things like your firewalls or things like your system security. Here's an example of what Nessus looks like. Uh, as you can see here, I have a scan of three different machines, um, the dot one, dot three, and dot fifty hosts. On this particular one, I'm looking at the dot one, and you can see the ports that were open, what protocol is being used, and what service is being used, and any vulnerabilities associated with that. Here's an example, uh, example of ZenMap, uh, which is a graphical front end for NMap, and it does scanning as well. You can see here the NMap command, which is a text-based command that would be run and the output if you were using it in a console. 
And you can see how it's discovering the open ports on a particular client. In this case, the .2, the .1, the .50. .2 and .1 both were running web services. So I can go after those. It will also further enumerate it if needed and tell you that it's running Internet, uh, excuse me, IIS, which is Windows, Windows's um, web server, or if it's running Apache, which is usually used by Linux. Um, but it can also be run on, on Windows. And it can tell you that so you can go after that particular application and find the holes in it. Again, it's all part of enumerating your network and figuring out what you're running so we can find the ways to get through it. Uh, honey pots and honey nets. So with a honey pot and honey net, what we're dealing with is a system that is designed to be attractive to an attractive target for an attacker. So if an attacker is making its way through your firewall, you want them to go after this shiny object over here and not your actual systems. And so what the honey pot is is a system that is deliberately designed to attract these guys to use their resources and time to attack your honey pot and leave your real stuff alone. A honey net is simply when you have multiple honey pots, they work together in coordination. And the other thing we can use honey pots and honey nets for is to study how attackers conduct their attacks. So if I have a corporation and I'm constantly being bombarded with attacks, if I set up these honey pots, I can see where the attackers are coming from, what techniques they're using. And that way I can put better things in place to stop them in the future. And the last thing we have is our remote access security. So remote access security is all about controlling access to our network devices, such as our routers, our switches, our servers, and our clients. We can do this with many different ways. We've talked before about SSH, which is Secure Shell. It is a secure remote access that can be done via a terminal emulator. So it's a text-based command and control system for us to remote into a server or switch or uh, router. RADIUS, on the other hand, is a standard, it's an open standard that uses UDP for authentication over a network, usually used in conjunction with our 802.1x. TACUS is a, um, is a Cisco proprietary system. Uh, it is TCP based and is another authentication protocol. RADIUS and TACUS are pretty much the two big ones in that space. Uh, IEEE 802.1x we've spoke about before. We can do this on wired or wireless clients and we, it allows us to permit or deny, deny access to the local area network based on an authentication. Two-factor authentication is a method that we use where we have two pieces of authentication required. Uh, we talk about this in A plus as well as Security Plus. If you have something you know, something you have, and something you are, those are three different categories of things. If you have two of those three, you have what's called two-factor authentication. Um, some, a good example of that is if you have a token, like an RSA token, that gives you a PIN number you have to put in, in addition to your username and password. That would be something you have, the token, and something you know, your username and password. And the last thing is single sign-on. Uh, this is becoming very popular in organizations. As we've gotten more and more usernames and passwords, single sign-on is used where we can authenticate once, but we can access multiple systems inside of our network. And so we use a shared logon throughout the whole system. And it's very beneficial to the end user because they only have to have one password instead of 300 passwords to remember. So it's very useful. And that's the basics of how we are going to protect our network with the different things uh, going through the system.